This is Design Chat. This is the best live do design discussion on the internet. Uh, I'm your host, Ryan McGovern. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Uh, I'm an art director from the uh, Midwest. And uh, Design Chat, you know, is a way to reach out to the design community. It started as a, just a Twitter thing. And, and every once in a while, like last week, we go back to just purely a Twitter-based discussion. Uh, so look for weeks in which we might be doing that in the future. Uh, although we're going to be really busy in the next few weeks coming up here. Uh, we've got a couple um, uh, really cool guests and then a CUSP conference tonight. We are extremely lucky to be talking to Mr. Daniel Burka, Creative Director at Dig.com. Daniel, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to get into you know all the stuff that you've done in the past with uh, with Silver Orange. I'm probably saying it wrong right now. Um, uh, from Canada and no, Pounce think... and Mozilla Firefox and, and all that good stuff. So welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's fun to be here. Awesome, awesome. So um, I think we're uh, I think we're tweeted out for uh, for Mashable, so the the room should fill up really quick here. Um, let's start go by just uh, getting a little uh, personal history on you. Like, how did you get involved in design? Did you always know you were going to get involved in, in design? Um, and you know, your kind of school, your background. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I kind of lucked into being in design. I guess in, I, in high school, I was taking a, a graphic design course. So I was really lucky that our, our school had something like that. And uh, this is in the early days of the web. And I started working with a, you know, a few friends. And we figured out that we could do some summer projects doing some websites or some, some government funding to help students get into that kind of thing. And so we did some projects for, um, for museums, actually. This is in eastern Canada, in Prince Edward Island. And... Uh, we, we just, it was me and three or four friends. We did a, a few projects like that. And then we, you know, we're basically just learning, flying by the seat of our pants, trying stuff out. And at, at that stage, you know, people, there was no real, like, you know, web design industry. This is a real fledgling, you know, stuff. This is 1997, 1998. And, uh, and we really got into it and figured out, hey, you can make a bit of money at this. this is really interesting. And uh, a few of us were going to college and then running this company on the side. And we had formed Silver Orange by this point in uh, 1999. And uh, I was going to college studying history at the same time as running this web design company. And you know, eventually that, that company really took off. We really did some great things. So very few of the people at Silver Orange are, are formally trained in design or even development. A few of the guys have CS degrees. But um, mostly it was, it was real trial and error, you know, watching what other people were doing and you know, self-critique. You know, I think there's a real value in having, you know, a bunch of smart friends who, you know, aren't overly nice to each other and are willing to critique each other. And, you know, we all grew up and matured as designers together. Um, so how long uh, did sort of, you know, Silver Orange sort of survive before you started reaching out from there? Um, I just, you just said, uh, I just saw your tweet the other day, that it's 10 years old, Silver, Silver Orange has been around for yeah. 10 years. Wow. Yeah, it's hard to believe. I mean, we're a bunch of geezers now. But <laughs> you, we had started a company called, it was called whiteland.com originally. And, like, we were literally working out of the attic of the old house, and my mother helped us set up the company. You know, we were 15, 16 years old when we started doing this stuff, and then we formed Silver Silver Orange when I think I was 19, and then you know things didn't weren't immediately successful with Silver Orange. We you know did a lot of small projects, kind of started building up a portfolio, and then we kind of started hitting our stride and started getting bigger projects. You know it's a real catch-22 that you know any young web designer gets into that you can't get great work until you've done great work, but you know you you have to figure out both at the same time, and we we eventually figured out that. Uh, we offered a few companies the option to do uh, a commission, do, do websites on a commission basis. So there's, you know, a local company that did a, you know, nationwide mailing, you know, they're, they're a big e-commerce site. Well, not, sorry, they're a big, uh, like, mail order site. And, uh, but their website was terrible. And so we said, hey, we're pretty sure we can make your website way better. Give us, you know, X percent of your sales online and we can do something great for you. And they're they're like, well, we can't possibly lose with this because they knew their website wasn't performing very well. 
um, we got that contract and made a lot of money on it, which was great. You know, they disliked us for having made so much money because, <laughs> you know, we, we basically, we bet big on it and, and we came out on top for the first few years of the contract and then we renegotiated. But right. it was a great way to get our toe in the door with like a big serious project. You know, that, that site does millions of dollars a year in, uh, in sales. And from there, we, we really led on to doing, you know, kind of bigger and better and things. And now we you know, do a lot of work with, you know, companies in the San Francisco area and, you know, kind of companies all over the world, which is it's pretty amazing for a bunch of, you know, kids from a small town in eastern Canada. That's the best way to get started, man. You know, a bunch of people are really dedicated to what they do and being passionate about it. Um, just a couple uh, exactly. uh, quick notes here. Uh, we're broadcasting from Samana Mason in West Dundee, Illinois. Uh, on Twitter, they're at Samana Mason. Um, so just a quick thanks to them for letting us do that. And also, we're, uh, so we're on the Matchable chat lounge. Uh, thanks again to Matchable for letting us do this. We do this every week. Um, so uh, watch for announcements about Design Chat from at Hoopajoob and at Design Chat. Uh, link it up as, uh, as, oh, I'm forgetting who Gary V might say, link it up. Um, okay, so, uh, so going through your sort of growing pains and getting started and, and getting silver orange up off the ground and running, um, there's always trials and tribulations. What are some of the, like, the failures you can think of or things that just went like horribly wrong or things you should just never do? You know, those learning experiences that you can only get by, um, uh, by doing something wrong the first time. Sure. Um, there's a few things actually which are kind of good universal lessons that um, we, we spent a lot of time, I remember maybe two years in, we got contacted by this company. It was like a big entertainment company. And they were producing quite a, quite a large show that was playing in America and in Canada. And we thought this is a great opportunity. And we had never worked with um, people in the entertainment industry before. And they're very used to doing spec work. And they, they asked us to do a lot of work. And we, had, we did a, a lot of stuff maybe, we probably did three weeks of work before we signed a contract. And we ended up not signing a contract. They ended up dropping us. And we had done all this work. And they basically took it. And they, they had all the stuff we'd already done without being paid. So you know, doing spec work seems like a good way to get your toe in the door when you're you know, young and don't have a lot of experience. And it's, it's, a real, it's a really sketchy business. I don't understand why you know, there, there are certain industries, particularly the entertainment and the ad world, where that's, that's seen as commonplace. I think the web industry is right to push back against that. There's so much value in the, the ideas you're bringing up. You know, they can pay you to execute on them. That's, that's the easy part. It's coming up with the ideas and, you know, coming up with suggestions that where your greatest value is. So we, we definitely got burned that way up front. I also like um, Jeffrey Zeldman's advice. I, I'm not sure if it's still on his site, but I remember he had a, uh, um, a thing on his site it was like an FAQ. Like he, I'm sure he gets asked tons and tons of questions by young designers, and one of them was, you know, if you could give any piece of advice to, uh, to a young designer, what would you say? And his advice was basically get half your money up front. And it sounds cold and business-like. Yeah. Honest to God, get half your money up front because you will get jacked by clients if you don't. Especially really... like until you've got a relationship with a client, that's uh, great advice. You can tell if they're serious. If they're willing to put their money up, then they're they're a serious client. It's really funny you mentioned that because uh, last week, like I said, we did a um, just a Twitter-based design chat. So it's just talking with the community and, and raising questions and topics. And that's one of the topics that came up is spec work, um, and and yeah. it's it, you know pluses and minuses. And it, it it was really funny because we had somebody in there who um, was being successful at it, and then we had a couple uh, people who were very much <laughs> vehemently the, against it, and they had this like mean? epic battle. Well, I, I think I think the person was actually running a site um, for bidding on jobs, and so not only was he winning jobs, but yeah. he was having people come through his system. And if if I'm correct, he was he was making some money off of things that were going on. So he you know because he's making money on it, he's defending it. But it's one of those things. I don't have a whole lot of experience with it, um, just from what I've read a little bit. But you know, it's those invaluable lessons growing up. You know, as a business. Uh, you know that once you get burned like that, you you have to treat it as a, you know, as a real business, and and the service that you're you're offering, you know, is of a certain quality, and you know, it's, right. you know, you get what you pay for, sort of thing. Right, and this is 
this is actually maybe this sounds callous, but it was an interesting lesson we learned early on at Silver Orange, and we we used to be very careful about our pricing, and we were you know we were young young designers, and we didn't know how much our work was worth, and we didn't know if we were good or not, you know these kinds of things, and uh, we found out over the years that the more you charge, often the more smoothly your relationship goes with the client. You know it's kind of counterintuitive. You would think that you know the more you're charging, the more demanding they'll be, but the when you're charging, you know, $150, $200 an hour, the client is basically hiring you as the expert to take care of their problem. And what they want to do is hand you a problem. They don't want to meddle in it. They want you to deal with it. And just, you know, they're, they're the kind of people with big problems that just need dealing with. And they don't, you know, whereas the guy you're you know, only charging $20 or $30 an hour with is, you know, they're, for them that feels like a lot of money and they're, they're constantly meddling in your work. It, it's a, once you can get up to that level, it, you'll find it, it smooths out significantly. Do you think that by lowering your prices, you also lower the expectations of your clients? Uh, somewhat. They, they certainly don't expect you to be as big of an expert, right? And that's why they meddle in your work more, because they're, they don't feel like they're hiring somebody who just you know, is a problem solver. They feel like they're hiring a technician, and you, know, you can bug a technician over and over again. So you also think that the more that you charge, um, the less that, that the client actually meddles in the work and it gets in and like micromanages? Oh, absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting you should jack your clients. I mean, charge what, what you're worth. But, right. um, but don't hesitate, That's particularly if you're, you've got quite a bit of work coming in, don't hesitate to, to try charging a little bit more to the next guy who comes in because you know, you'll, you'll see what happens if they, if they take your contract or not. You know, and I realize not everyone's in that position, but once you get to that place, it, it's interesting to experiment with. Mm -hmm. um, so you're at Dig right now in San yeah. Francisco, correct? Uh, which is awesome. Um, Indeed. I'm a big, I'm a big Dig fan. Uh, I caught on uh, pretty early, and you know, watching the podcast and just being on the site in general. How long have you been there now? I've been working on Dig since about three months into the project. So Kevin really? had started up the site with Ron and uh, this developer named Owen and uh, kind of got it off the ground, realized you know, they want to get a proof of concept out there, and then Kevin realized it was, this was the real deal. It was a good site. It was, you know, the idea was strong, and mm -hmm. then he realized he needed design help, and he hired Silver Orange to work on the design, and I was the primary designer on the project, and that relationship eventually evolved into me you know, moving down here and working on Dig full time. How was that first connection made? Was did they, you know, did they put out the word and, and you answered something, or did they know of your reputation already? How did that first connection happen? Yeah, Kevin. Kevin knew who we were through the Mozilla work we had done. He really liked that Mozilla stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so he called us up and he's just like, "Hey, this is, this is Kevin Rose. I'm a guy who does a TV show in the U.S." Now I'd never heard of Kevin Rose before. I actually found it fun, quite funny after I found out he was like. You know, a bit of a celebrity. You walk into Best Buy and people actually recognize them sometimes. Wow. That's really cool. Um, and, uh, so, so let's do the, so let's talk about Mozilla. Okay, the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sure. There's a lag. Oh, I was just going to say, you called us up and said, I've got this website and I've got this amount of money. And we're like, whoa, I can give you maybe a week's worth of work for that amount of money. And he goes, come on, can you give me more? And I'm like, Let's just see how this goes. I ended up doing almost two weeks of work because it was really fun working with him. You know, you can never tell before you start with yeah. a client if, if they're going to be good to work with or not. And uh, no, Kevin was yeah. a great client, and uh, that that design work worked really well. It was nice. We we kind of tested the waters with each other to see if he was a good client and see if um, see if we were going to produce something that was useful for him. And uh, the first design work went really well, and then we ended up you know kind of having an ongoing contract. So I was doing you know a week a month, and then two weeks a month, and then. Then I moved down here and did it full time. What, when he first pitched you the idea of what Dig was going to be, what was your first thoughts about it? I thought it sounded cool. I was like, I, it was kind of surprising that no one had tried it before. You know, I, you look at it and it's like, well, that's news, but you know, I get to choose what's the news. You know, if you get enough enough people around that idea, that sounds pretty cool. You know, this is in the early days of Web 2.0, so people weren't excuse me, using all the social buzzwords and the Ajax hadn't been coined yet. But uh, yeah, you could kind of see, you could already see it coming. You could see that this was a good idea and it had legs. 
So, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the other things. Civil War had gotten to a point where mm -hmm. we we're, you know, getting decent contracts with people, and so we were basically more skeptical of tackling projects where it didn't look like it had a future. You know, it's just something really uh, kind of it's a bit of a downer to work on a project that you don't feel has a lot of potential. And uh, mm -hmm. but dig, he calls in, and we're like, that's solid. You know, that'd be a, that'd be really fun to work on. So, and it turned out to be true. So when you say um, creative director at Dig, what sort of things are you responsible for? What's your world? Uh, is it is it just visuals? Talk about you know interactivity and usability and that sort of thing. What's your world at Dig? Sure, sure. Yeah, I still find these. You know, I've always worked for really small companies. I mean, Silver Orange was you know it's 13 people now, and you know I've been doing that since I was 18. And so to get to a company where these titles actually really matter seems kind of funny because my, my role hasn't changed a whole lot since I first started here. It's, you know, I'm basically in charge of making sure products make sense and that they make sense to the user and the user interface. So I help vet products, I help, you know, come up with product ideas, and then I take it all the way through to production with the development teams. Um, and now I do that, you know, I'm a creative director because I do that with a bunch of people. So I've got, um, a team of people. Mark Trammell works for me, and uh, Danny Trin, who's this 18-year-old kid. He's born in the 90s. He works for me. It's, he's really, really talented. <laughs> and um, Nicole Gregory, is the other designer, works with me. And uh, you know, all of us are in charge of. We basically, you know, help vet product ideas. You know, no matter where they come from in the company. So I spend a lot of time working with Kevin on. Hey, these ideas came up. Do they make sense? How do they fit into the product vision? How do they fit into the product technically? Mm -hmm. And then work really close to the development teams and everyone else at Dig in terms of seeing them through, seeing them through into development. So it's a very broad spectrum of a job. Um, just a note to uh, all the people in the room. Uh, we're going to do uh, sort of a, a chat uh, for the next, I don't know, half hour or so, or 20, 25 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the uh, to the chat room and uh, we'll do a Q&A with people uh, coming to watch. So uh, so it sounds like you, it's like a four or five person team so you know it's not like a huge you know environment. What Talk about the, uh, the like the actual work environment. You know I, I would imagine it, it doesn't feel like a corporation. Sure. It doesn't feel like a nine-to-five and you guys you know have some sort of fun and you know what, what's that like there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Dig, Dig's a pretty good place to work. It, it's, it's funny because it's changed a lot since I've come here. You know, when I first started, you know, there were four of us working on the website. Now there's, you know, close to 90 people at Dig. So it is a little bit corporate sometimes. But, you know, we're certainly not stuck in cubes, you know, wearing suits all day. Um, it's, a, it's a fun place to work. We, you know, sit around with some very, very, very smart people. Some of the development team here is totally brilliant. And... You know, oh, how to describe this without just using hyperbole? Um, it's 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 fun. I mean, we go uh, sit around, drink beers, and talk about. You know, I was sitting around yesterday with uh, a beer, sitting around with two developers and a designer, talking about how we can use HTML5 at Dig, and you know, kind of specking out. You know, what are the the useful features? What are the not so useful features? How can we scale to there? You know, because HTML5 is not that well supported right now, but you know, we want to start thinking in that direction already. And you know, to have that power and that flexibility on a site the size of Dig that carries that much traffic is is fun. You know, we wield a considerable amount of power sometimes, and it's you know, it's intimidating and it's really fun because we can make mistakes on grand scales and we can make successes on on massive scales as well. How do you think Sorry, HTML5? Really no, that's really right. Roundabout answer. How do you think HTML5 is going to change Dig? Um, I mean, I think in the next year, not a whole lot. I think the support is too poor. Um, but I think in the the near future, we're going to set ourselves up. So we're using a lot of the structures for HTML5, and then we can start using some of the stuff where it's it's really tied um, to JavaScript and uh, and significantly more. Go ahead. For, uh, for some of our crowd who might not know what HTML5 is or that it even existed, can you give a sort of a quick, brief description? Ooh. Um, oh, I don't know if I'm going to do this very well, very good justice. Um, there are lots of great articles out there, so I'd encourage you to read more than what I'm about to say. But um, HTML5 introduced a bunch of 
new significantly more semantic tags to the to the DOM so you can grab things like um like instead on dig right now we have all these nested divs right and they basically have arbitrary classes and IDs on them so you know I'm, I have a section and I call it class equals main and that's where the the contents of the main page go but in HTML5 I can actually define that as literally as a section sections one of the new tags so I can say, you know, bracket, bracket, section, and then inside of here is a whole list of articles. Article is another one of the new tags. And so I can actually define these things in a very standards-y way. Um, and then in the future, you'll be able to, you know, use these as, as hooks with your JavaScript, which is going to be really cool. Um, one of the things that I'm sort of aiming to do with Design Chat is to cover really broad ranges uh, of design, because mm -hmm. design can, can touch so many different industries I think and um, so what we're talking about tonight you know is mostly going to be web design um, uh, I had mentioned in one of my notes to you earlier I wanted to ask you know had you had any experience in print design and, and what that, right. that had been and, and on that same note um, you know there there's a whole lot of argument happening right now that print design is dead um, and that you know people should only focus on multimedia and that sort of thing what, what are your ideas on that Oh, I mean, I think people have been claiming print is dead for a long time, and I doubt that's the case. Um, I, I'm, I'm like one of the first generations of print, uh, of web designers who's only done web design. You know, I was like, you know, maybe 16 or 17 when I started really getting into design, and that was when the web was taking off. So I feel really like a fish out of water when I'm doing print designs, like stuff like trapping and, you know, different types of effects on paper. I have no idea what I'm doing. So, you know, I've done some business cards and some letterhead, that, these kinds of things, and it's really awkward for me. But, um, so I'm much more comfortable on the web, but I, I'm, I'm not sure why people would say print, de, print design's dead. I think that you might see a merging of these two things in the, in the nearest future. You know, stuff like, when we've got, you know, significantly high, higher speed internet connections and, you know, higher resolution, you know, low light emitting displays, you know, stuff like e-paper, the, these two things are going to be so much more similar to each other. I think the people who can understand both, you know, the interaction side of the web, as well as some of the, the finer points of, you know, the history of print design, you know, know some of those standards, they'll, they'll be in a good place to take advantage of that. Yeah, I think you can make some parallels too. I mean, just like you were saying, I mean, once you have like e-paper and that sort of thing, um, you know, I think the transition for someone who's in print or in just user interface design I think is easy because I mean if you think about it if you're designing a brochure and you've got 10 pages and then this thing folds in here but you want the user to the reader to open it yeah. and then see this message first I think you can draw a lot of parallels in that you know and that and that's one of the reasons why um, you know we have this wide variety uh, of, of people involved in design and I think especially for the people who are interested in design chat at least I mean I, you know there's a whole part of the audience that is they're only web designers. That's all they've done, and you know that's all they went to school for. And right. then we have like traditional people who went to like visual communication degrees, um, you know, and they're applying their visual communication in any number of different fields, including web design and multimedia. I mean, that's something right. that I have to deal with on, on on a daily basis. Is you know I have to be able to if someone if a client comes to me and says you know I want a touch screen interactive experience when my consumer walks in the store, we have to be able to cover all areas there. Right. Um, I mean, all of these surround having an empathy for your end user, right? I mean, in print design, it's the person who's going to pick up your pamphlet. In web design, it's the person who's going to browse to your, your website. And, you know, there's tons and tons and tons of technical nuance between the two. You know, like print designers need to understand how an offset press works, whereas web designers need to understand the nuances of browsers. The, but these things are all learnable. You know, I think a lot of it, if you're empathetic and, you know, can understand and sympathize with a, w a wide range of people and understand how a wide range of people are going to use whatever you produce, I think you have an easier time navigating between the two worlds. Mm -hmm. um, to, to segue a little bit, uh, a, a topic we got into, um, uh, what was it, last, two weeks ago with Pete Cashmore was um, the Apple tablet and how oh, that... Man. Oh, let me open the file here. I'm going to play a little video behind me. There was a video that was put out on the internet today, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are calling fake on this uh, video, and legitimately so. Um, but we got to talking about how the, the tablet and the touch interface might change the design profession completely. 
and you know how much the design profession is used to change because in the last 50 years I mean 20 30 years ago people were still taking photographs uh, yeah. of layouts and cutting type out with scissors yeah you know, so I know so, a few people designers today who've done that yeah it's crazy yeah and and some people some designers like to get back to that route and and actually you know work with handmade typography because you can achieve a look that's just not capable on a computer um, I'm sure you're aware of all the rumors that are going on about the touchscreen uh, tablet. How do you think bit, that's yeah. going to affect the design world? Oh, you know, I, I really don't know. I think we'll adapt fine. Again, it's all about, you know, like it'll work your first time doing an iPhone app, for instance. It's like, whoa, okay, some of this smells like a website, but, you know, the interaction you're working with, like a big fat finger rather than a, you know, rather than a nice little mouse point, and you just, figure out what the new limitations are and what the new benefits are and start working within that toolkit. You know, it's, it's, you have to know where your restrictions are and where your possibilities are and then you know where you can, you can really evolve things and improve things. And so when you're working on a... Same case. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Now we're both waiting for each other. <laughs> Uh, so when you're working on a website uh, or a project, you actually think to yourself, this smells like a website. So are you telling me you have the capability to smell your design? <laughs> yeah, there's a term I've been using a lot lately. You know, this thing smells like that thing. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like an X-Men feature. Yeah, I'm a super designer. <laughs> <laughs> How would you fight crime by smelling design? I want to know about that. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I'll be sure not to admit any odiferous seminations. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry, I had, to, I had to follow that one. That's All right, I'll get, <laughs> I'll get back to the real design talk. Um, let's talk about uh, Mozilla. So that, that was a, an earlier experience for you. So that was earlier on sure. in, in your experience with, uh, with, with Silver Orange. Yeah, I, I, I read somewhere you worked on the Firefox logo somewhere along the line. Yeah, yeah. So this is a great story, actually, if you, if you don't mind if I go on a little bit. Please, please so do. Like a, a classic open source story. So what happened was is uh, at the time it was, uh, I think they had just changed the name from um, Phoenix to Firebird. So this was the, you know, the first spin-off of what would become Firefox. Mm -hmm. So out of SeaMonkey, which was the old Netscape suite, they created this, um, Ben Goodger and, and a couple other people created this browser and it was called Phoenix and then they called it Firebird and the, the branding was brutal. So first of all, they named it after an open source database, which was, even I knew that was a database at the time, because the Firebird was. And, uh, and so they, they were, they got to this point, and they had this decent browser, it was a really good piece of software, but it kind of had a crappy name, and all of the branding around it, you know, the user interface for it, the logo, all these things were very amateur. And Stephen Garrity, who's the creative director at Silver Orange, he wrote an open letter to Mozilla on his weblog, and he said, you know, he wrote this, this really, you know, well thought out article basically arguing that, hey, you've got this great piece of software and, you know, I love it and would love to use it. And, uh, but I, I refuse to because it, it just looks, it doesn't look like a real piece of software. You know, this is where branding can really let a, let a project down. And about two days later, he gets an email from uh, one of the guys at Mozilla and he said, hey, it sounds to me like you just volunteered. You know, this is so open source, right? You know, it's yeah, a community yeah. of volunteers mostly. And, uh, and Steve was like, damn it, all right, now I can do this. And he said he got permission from the, this guy at Mozilla to put together a group called the Mozilla Visual Identity Team, which was um, myself and him and one of the other guys from Silver Orange, Stephen DeRoche, uh, John Hicks, the great illustrator from, from England. Um, so we'd actually seen one of John's earlier logos he had done for a, a BitTorrent client. And we're like, that, that's awesome. If we're ever doing logo work, we've got to talk to this guy. And so um, Stephen talked to John Hicks and Steve Horlander and a few other people were in this group. And so we, we had a bunch of us and we were all talking about these new names. And eventually they settled on the, the name Firefox. And uh, I was really pushing for the name Cardinal because it was, it was all bird themed before that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I lost out. And so they came <laughs> with this name Firefox and we were, we were brainstorming around the logo and... Uh, I had actually had a childhood Bible that had um, this really beautiful illustration of uh, Samson lighting the fox's tails on fire. It's part of the whole Samson story in Philistine. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I 
uh, had sketched actually on a whiteboard a really rough version of a fox wrapped around a globe because we had talked about the globe as being you know the imagery for the internet and the fox was obviously you know fox being on fire was you know made sense for the Firefox name. You know, it was very literal, but it, it mm -hmm. had a real aesthetic quality. And, uh, and so I sketched really quickly of these, these two things wrapped up together and uh, posted on our intranet. And uh, Steve Durosh, who's one of the designers at Silver Orange, sketched out in pencil and actually looks surprisingly similar to what, what ended up happening. And then John Hicks, who's, he deserves 95% of the credit. The guy's insanely talented. Um, went and, and drew what is now the, the Firefox logo you've got behind you there. And uh, it still, it blows my mind that, you know, a ton of people have downloaded that thing and, you know, you see it on, you know, somebody stamped it into a wheat field, like a crop circle, like a few years ago. It's like, it's crazy watching something you had like even a little hand in being, you know, all over the place. It's, it's really, really cool. I think on that note, so, um, is Silver Orange happening at the time that it did and you getting involved in uh, Mozilla at the time that you did. I, you know, I, I think when we, you know, 20, 30 years from now when we're looking back at design books, I think we're going to see an era called Design Web 2.0 because right when those companies started, you know, splashing all over the internet, we talked about this two weeks ago and I know I, I hit on the subject a lot, but there's a style, an inherent style that, you know, Apple was a big part of, the shiny reflections and gradients and that sort of thing. Uh, how cool is it to look back and say that you're going to be, you personally are a big part of that sort of design movement? A little part, sure. Come yeah, on, it's, it's cool. big part, big part. It's, it's cool. Like I was looking the other day, I was at a friend's house yesterday and uh, he opened up Firefox and opened a new tab and the Firefox start page came up and I designed that. I was looking at it I'm like, that page has probably been seen like maybe a trillion times. Wow. That's crazy. You know, anytime anyone opens a new tab, unless they change the default, that's they get this page I made. Like that's it's kind of mind blowing. That's so cool. Well, I mean, um, what other parts of the Mozilla sort of interface were you a part right. of? So I had like a little hand in making the Firefox logo, and then after mm -hmm. that, see this. There was this weird relationship between Mozilla at the time and the Mozilla Store, which was a separate entity. Right? There was this mm -hmm. guy who ran a Mozilla Store. And the guy from the Mozilla store hired Silver Orange to redesign his, the store, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, to get better placement on the Mozilla website, he gave us money to redesign the Mozilla site. So we got some money and some volunteer time and did the Mozilla.org site. And that was primarily my work. So I did a lot of the design work for Mozilla.org, which mm -hmm. eventually became, when, became Mozilla.com when they, they incorporated you know, and became this nonprofit, for-profit combination. And uh, so I had some work on Mozilla.com uh, as well later on when I was still at Silver Orange. That's just so cool to, to be able to tell that story and, and be part of that as it started to, um, it started to grow and, and become popular. Yeah. And, and, uh, and this was right before, you know, before Firefox had really taken off. You know, it was just still this real niche, geeky browser and then, you know, started becoming really mainstream. The, the work Chris Messina did with Spread Firefox really did a lot for that, you know, getting an ad in the New York Times and mm -hmm. you know, getting some really great press. And then, you know, it took off. And it was actually really funny when I, I came down to work on DIG. I have a, I'm a Canadian, right? And so to get into the States, I needed a, a visa. And I applied for a TN visa, which means you have to basically convince a border guard that you're a qualified graphic designer. And so I'm talking to this guy, and they're, they're real hard asses. And uh, he's grilling me, and he's trying to figure out, like, why they would hire me and, instead of someone else. And I'm trying to be immodest, which is a little, you know, difficult. And I, I'm talking about some of the work I've done. He goes, oh, I never heard of that stuff, never heard of this stuff. <laughs> and I told, him, I told him I worked on the Firefox stuff. And he was like, oh, yeah, my wife installed Firefox. We never use Internet Explorer anymore. And he started stamping stuff, and then I got my visa. <laughs> I was like, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> like a monkey who was, like, stamping stuff on the desk? Oh, because he was, he was like, really playing, playing hard with me and, you yeah. know, saying I was going to have to wait for hours and, like, all this stuff. And, you know, my flight left in an hour or something. You know, I'm in the airport. And, uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, and then he just started stamping things, and I'm kind of looking at him like, is this a good thing? And he just hands me my papers and goes, go pay, pay your fee over there and you're done. And I was like, this is great. So the Mozilla people really like that story. That's hilarious. Yeah, well, it's pretty funny. Um, 
what other sort of like crazy interactions have you had because of that work? I'm, you know, one of the things that I'm finding as I'm reaching out for this show is that the more connections I make, the more that open up, you know. So I'm sure having done and being involved in some of this, you just uh, the yeah. meetings that you get involved, invited to, and that sort of thing. Tell me some about that. Oh, I mean, it's it's really fun. I mean, the connections you get through Dig. I mean, we're basically hanging out all of the time with the people who develop big chunks of the internet. You know, I hang out with the guys from Facebook. Hang out with, you know, the Twitter guys, and you know, these when you're in San Francisco and you're working on something you know, interesting, you, you get to chat to so many interesting people, and, uh, you know, it opens up so many doors, and it was, it was really funny, I actually was up at a uh, food camp, up at the O'Reilly campus up in Sebastopol a few months ago, and one of the guys from Mozilla was there, who I didn't, didn't know, who's currently working on the interface for Firefox, he's wearing a really cool Firefox shirt that I'd never seen before, I was like, oh, dude, I really like your shirt, and he goes, oh, I might be able to get one for you. I'm like, that's cool, that's cool. I actually worked on that logo. And he's like, whoa, you know, <laughs> we never met each other in person, and it, it was really cool. That's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, there's some crazy times, you know, like, you know, the other day, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Ashton Kutcher was in our office. You know, like, MC Hammer was here a couple months ago. Like, it's, it's kind of surreal. It's got to be like sort of a so, revolving door circus in that office, I'm sure. Sometimes, some days, yeah. Yeah, like my get this. I so I've got this this really cute Bernese Mountain Dog puppy, and uh, Kevin was doing a photo shoot a few months ago, and uh, for Reader's Digest, you know, it's like it's goofy, but it's the world's like most distributed magazine, I think, right? And he grabbed the dog, and it was just like they they took a bunch of photos of him holding the dog, and there's photos of my dog in Reader's Digest magazine, like kind of messed up, you know? It's really funny. One of our developers, his grandmother, mailed in a bunch of uh, dog treats into the office because she's like, oh, that dog's adorable. I'll send you some dog <laughs> treats, son, you know, and, like sent them in. It's really cute. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, I'm completely yeah, distracted dog. Somebody just by wrote the dog that in the chat. Dig dog. Yeah, it's awesome. There's a bunch of dogs at the office, which is a real nice perk. There's a, a big, huge uh, Pyrenees lately, which is awesome. It's like uh, 140 pounds, I think. So I'm totally do they just randomly. Like, don't do they don't just let me sort of chat about dogs. I'll just go on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, people okay. just bring them in. Yeah, people bring them in. There. We kind of have like a, a penned in area, and they they run around while we're working. It's kind of cool. That's funny. I was actually thinking about bringing in my. I've got a boxer. Uh, not to stick oh, on awesome. my dog story, but uh, I was thinking about oh, bringing man, her love, into the show dogs. every time. Because I got because uh, I got so, the, I got the nine to five job. So on Wednesdays. You know, I'll work the full day and hopefully be off by five so nothing goes wrong, you know. And then I've got to right. go home, let the dog out, and then drive here and start the show. Right. And uh, I always feel bad that i got to put the dog away, you know, back in her cage uh, for the rest of the night before I come home. So I think, I think she needs to be our mascot. Yeah, I think she needs to be That'd our be mascot awesome. here. I, but, of course, I'll ask permission of Mr. Samata and Mr. Mason before I start bringing in <laughs> random animals to their design shop. Um, yeah. I'm sure they'll be nice about it. So, uh... It says here you've also worked on Revision 3. Um, revision 3 has been right. around for five years? What are, about the same time as Dig, yeah. It's about, about five, four dig. and a half, five years. Yeah. How early so were dig. you on in that? So I, I actually did um, one of the revisions of the site. So they, they originally did some really god-awful, super basic site. I think Ron Gordevsky actually did the design. He's their developer. Mm -hmm. At the time was their developer. And, uh, and so they had this thing, and then I was you know, Kevin kept thinking it was really ugly, and I, I ended up putting some time into it. So they hired Silverhorn to do the work, and I, I was doing some of the design. And uh, so I did that version. It was uh, originally like a black and green website, and I helped, um, I hired a logo designer to work. We just on lost. Vision 3 logo. This, this really talented guy. Can you do that last sentence real quick? I think we just lost you for a second. Sure. So I was saying, um, they had this really ugly basic website, and then uh, they hired Silver Orange, basically hired me to do the um, the design work to, to bring it up to, to snuff kind of thing. And uh, so I, I got involved, and I hired a logo designer and worked with him on, on the identity for the site. And then this is the old black and green website. Having some tech problems website. here. Kind of the, the second version of Revision 3. And uh, am I getting hung up? 
Are we okay? I think we're sort of fading in and out right now, so uh, just green. keep on going with oh. it, and we'll see where we end up. Okay. Okay, so I did the second version of Revision 3, which was this black and green site with a, a black background, and uh, and then after a bit, the you know they were evolving quite a bit and had quite a few more shows, and uh, they eventually hired a designer named Stephanie Chu, who's quite talented, and uh, she's she's done all of the the current stuff. Um, sorry, I got distracted by the technical difficulties there. Uh, one of our subjects. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Last week was mentors, design mentors. Um, I wanted to ask you if you know sure. you've ever had a mentor for for what you do, um, and, uh, and you know how was that relationship, and and um, have you been a mentor? Have you sort of taken someone under your wing and, and helped them move along in their career? Well, as far as having a mentor, I mean, there's there's this guy I know, and he's really secretive, so maybe I won't even say who he is, but um, this older guy who who used to be the creative director at IBM and later on at um, Polaroid. Like, he's done some, he tells stories about doing projects with Andy Warhol. Like, he's done some crazy stuff. And uh, he actually was a, kind of a friend of Silver Orange's from a long time ago. I see him very, very regularly, maybe, you know, once every year or two. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I've, I've looked up to him a lot. He's, a, he's done all of these amazing things. And yet when he sits down with you, He's got this immense modesty. He's able to talk to you about your own projects. You know, this is back when we were doing, like, basically bed and breakfast websites. And this guy comes in. He says, oh, you guys are designers. That's really cool. You know, what are you doing? And, you know, he was talking to us and asking us what we thought of Photoshop. And he's the guy who helped get the, you know, the creative director of Photoshop hired at Adobe. You know, like, it's amazing. And he tells you about these projects he's worked on and how he's worked through some problems. And I found his, his insight has been, has been really valuable. video again losing video uh, anything no nope. we're still a little bit stuck what happened to your good connection at dig man I thought you had good web connection <laughs> and so oh, I'm sure it's fine. I like to say you know, even though he's my age um, Stephen Garrity who is you know the creative director at Silver Orange you're back now you're good as, uh, you know I've learned a lot from him working together about um, shoot I don't know. We we have a good connection. I was gonna say um, I'm age and you know I basically have learned most of what I know about doing interface design with Stephen. You know he was more of a designer before you know I really got into doing the interface stuff and you know he. Taught me most of what I know and I still bounce a lot of ideas off of. But and your the second part of your question and was asking if uh, I'm a mentor to anyone. I don't know, maybe. Um, I really like it when you know, young designers are visiting San Francisco and uh, you know, they ask, you know, hey, can you come out and have a coffee with me? I just want to chat about design with you. And if, you know, I'd go almost all the time. It's really funny. People are so intimidated about asking other designers out for coffee. And you know, like, I remember I was visiting San Francisco years ago. It was before I'd done much big work, and you know, we emailed Doug Bowman, and we're like, "Hey, Doug, we're going to be in San Francisco. You're one of my favorite designers working today." This is Doug Bowman. He's now the creative director at Twitter. It was at Facebook, uh, at, at Google for a while. So we got more experience than you, and, and get their insight on the projects you're working on right now, and just to make those connections. And I do that a lot with younger designers, and so yeah, I I, I don't know. Maybe I'm someone's mentor, but. I, I hate to think of it like that. They're just other designers who are interesting. Yeah, it's cool um, because of all the new ways of like connecting with people and you know the conversations don't have to be a phone conversation anymore. You can throw out a quick message on Twitter, you know, or you can write a short email, that sort of thing. These connections, more of these connections are happening. And that's the whole reason that Design Chat is even going on right now. Um, you mentioned Doug Bowman, and, and definitely that's a name that I'd, I, that's a type of person I'd also like to have on, on the show, and, and uh, uh, you know, to hear, you know, because he had that open letter to Google as he was leaving Google, and the, the design issues that he talked yeah. to about that's them, they have very strict policies on, on how design happens, um, you know, and it's interesting to hear those stories about 
you know, what's the design relationship with their company, you know, from, because the in-house sort of design group is a very different sort of entity than, you know, like an agency uh, environment, you know, so yeah. those are stories that I think are just really interesting. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I was just talking to Doug about that a, a few, maybe a week ago, I went out and had a coffee with him, and uh, yeah, it's really interesting hearing about the differences between working at Google and working at, at Twitter, and I think that'd be fascinating for your audience. There's, there's definitely different design worlds, and I've, you know, it's kind of interesting because I've done both. You know, maybe Civil Orange isn't really a typical agency, you know, it's a mm -hmm. small boutique, but, uh, but the differences between working on one project all the time and working on, you know, Six client projects at a time is very big differences. Um, do you does Dig have uh, sort of a, a design policy? Do they have uh, a testing period? Uh, I'm sure, of course, you guys have a testing period. But I mean, what what are the rules like? What what's I mean, once once an idea gets started uh, and you start going through layouts, tell us a little bit about the you know from the first sketch on the napkin to the final product. Sure, sure. Um, so it, there's, there's really no typical project. I think we, you know, kind of changes per project depending on how big it is or uh, you know, how complex it is. But the basic thing is, you know, somebody comes up with an idea in the company, and it could be just about anybody. Um, a lot of the ideas come from Kevin, uh, but you know, other people in the company come up with ideas all of the time, and they pitch them. They're like, hey, here's this thing. We should really build this into the site. And we're like, okay, well, you know, what's the general direction of the site? You know, how does this fit in? Technically, how would we do this? You know, things are very different when you're working at the scale of something like Dig. It's not, you know, you can't just build a comment system, you know. You have to worry about scale significantly. You know, that, is this going to work when you've got millions of people hitting it? And, uh, and so we vet, vet the ideas and figure out, you know, which are the good ones and which, you know, depending on how long they'll take to make, you know, you have to basically schedule it into a pipeline of work. You know, we've only got so many hours in the day to build stuff. You know, what, what are the priorities? And once we figured out, okay, this one's important, we're going to work on that one now for the next, you know, three weeks. And so we're, we use a, a, the Agile system, so we do sprints. And uh, we set up, okay, this is going to be a three-week sprint, and we're hoping to achieve this by this point. And so we basically try to do as much design beforehand as possible. So we lead a lot with design. We're like, we'll come up with Photoshop comps. We'll come up with, um, with uh, you know, uh, HTML and CSS comps. And then we... we uh, start, you know, pushing that around with some of the development team. We're like, okay, here's what we're thinking, and they'll suggest some adjustments, and then we settle on something and start getting into the code. And I spend a lot of time still doing implementation. So, you know, check stuff out of Subversion or, or just moved over to Git. Um, so I've got my own working copy and, you know, get in there with the developers, get them to prototype the stuff, and I get in there and make sure it's styled correctly um, like we had you know, plan it out in the first place, and then we do some user testing. Usually, we'll bring in people and, uh, uh, you know, and do actual task analysis with them, and uh, then make adjustments based on how those people used it. And sometimes we'll roll something out, you know, just to a small percentage of the dig audience. Like dig ads right now is only rolled out to a small group of people, and uh, and we test it and see what it's like in the wild. Make adjustments, you know. Uh, prepare it for, for a wider launch, and then we, we push it out to the world and see what really happens. So we do a lot of statistical analysis, you know, how do, what do people click on? Uh, you know, what stuff do they appear not to like? Which stuff is, you know, you know sometimes you can tell when things are really frustrating for people and they're, they're clicking around too much trying to, to, um, to get to the features they really want. And then we, we make adjustments to try to improve those things. So what is hopefully, guys? you know, I, oh, sorry, we're, we're starting to run our own in-house ads and so it's basically sponsored content so say uh, I'm a car dealership you know I'm Toyota I want to pr promote the new Prius I can buy it you probably can't see it on your screen there but um, I, I want to buy you know a, a story on the home page of dig and I can say I'm gonna sponsor this story and hopefully they're they're linking to a story from say Motor Trend which reviews the new Prius and saying oh this you know car is awesome the technology is really great and then you know it goes up on the site and so this I think I've seen that. So it, it looks just like a, a regular a new uh, story, or, but it's you know, got a thin a hairline above it. it. Yeah, it's got a thin hairline above it and below exactly, it. Yeah. And it says advertisement. You know, you, exactly. you know, so you're not hiding yeah. uh, that it's a, you're 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 open that it's an ad. Um, so it's only open to a right. few people right now, a small group. How, how many people and, right. and how successful has it been? It's a percentage. Um, I probably can't talk too much about the performance of it. Um, okay. But 
so far so good. I mean, we're, we're pretty excited about the idea. Um, and I mean, from a design perspective, if you think about this, it's, it's a hell of a design challenge, right? I mean, it might sound simple. You've got, you know, two little stripes and a, a bit of text above it, but we've been through a lot of design comps because what you're balancing is what the advertiser is willing to buy, right? Versus what the users, you know, can, you know, handle. And there's this real balancing act between making it clear enough to users that this advertising is artificially, you know, suggested on the site because we want to make sure it's clear that there's organic content and other content, right? Because we want to be fair, you know, we're moral people. And at the same time, it's not differentiating it so significantly that it's, you know, you can just jump over the ads really easily, right? So it's a huge balancing act. We go back and forth with advertisers. We go back and forth with the business development people here at DIG and going back and forth with the entire staff who are all users of the website and all have opinion. And so, and we do do user testing around this stuff to see how users react to it. Um, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left in the chat. Let's do, um, why don't you tell us a little bit, let, let's hit uh, on Pounce real quick before we open oh, sure. it up to the, um, the audience for the Q&A session. Um, I, I honestly, I have to admit that um, I tried Pounce out early on in, in its existence and uh, I think I was distracted. Uh, by, by other things I was getting into, so I can't say that I honestly had the full experience of Pounce. Um, so, for, right. so for those people who aren't aware with it, Pounce, um, Pounce was something that you initiated with Kevin and I'm, I'm forgetting the other Leah person's Culver. name. There's Leah Culver, right. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that story? Uh, sure. I, I like somebody just posted in the chat. It's John Victorino said, uh, aw, Pounce, he misses it. Uh, I, I agree with him totally. I miss it a little bit. It was a lot of work, but it was fun. Um, so Pounce was a messaging service that was uh, meant to, to be able to pass files and uh, events and messages and links to your friends. So it was uh, kind of in the early days of, a bit still early days of social messaging. And we had this idea that you wanted to pass like content modules from, from one person to the other. Uh, you know, uh, sending a file from one person to the other is a pain in the butt. It's, it's a pain in the butt to have a conversation around it. And, you know, this was kind of born out of that, uh, that problem. I remember Kevin and I were sitting in two cubes right across from each other. You know, he's sitting right in front of me, and he wanted to send me a, a music file, and he couldn't do it. You know, it was too big to go in the email, and it was a pain in the butt to go to one of the specific file sharing sites. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we're like, screw this, this is a real need, and we, we built this website. And Pounce was really fun. We ran it for about, I think, a year and a half or so, and then, uh, yeah, somebody just described it as FTP plus chat. That was, that was a part of the idea. Um, and it, it went quite well, but um, in the end, we kind of ran out of money and uh, and and decided it, uh, to to sell it, and we sold it to uh, Six Apart. And so Leah Culver and Mike Malone, who are the two developers, are now at Six Apart working on a, some really really interesting stuff over there with them. So so it in its its existence, it sort of faded out, and, and so now a sort of a, a new version of it, or a new way of interacting is something that's going to come out? Yeah, I can't speculate about what Six Apart's working on. It's like, so they bought Pounce because they wanted the, the developers and the, some of the technology, and now they're working on something else. And I can just tell you it's really exciting and interesting, but so I can't you tell you what they're working on. You can't say, is it going to be called Pounce? No, it won't be called Pounce. Okay. Well, as far as I know. Uh, so the cool. service is shut down, if that's what you're asking, yeah. Right, right. Um, man, I've got like 80 other things I want to bring up and talk to you about, but I think we're, we're closing in on our, on our hour here. Um, so let's take some time and, uh, and right. uh, throw, have, some, have the audience throw some questions at you. Um, so if you've seen any pop up that you haven't addressed yet, uh, go, you know, go for it. And this is usually when they start flying up so fast they're hard to read. Oh man, someone's <laughs> We lost the video again, so just uh, bear with us. We're having a little bit of technical so difficulty somebody right now. You have to impress millions of people make things work for all types of users. Have you ever rolled out something you weren't proud of design-wise, but it would be perfect from a usability standpoint? Um, all right, this may not be a direct answer to your question, but the I think the third revision of Ah, shoot. Can you hear my voice when I lose the video? All right. 
I don't think we're close. We're, we're, it's not matching up quite yet. Give it one more second. All right. I think you're good now. Okay. Okay. So I was going to say that the, the third revision of dig comments was um, was one of those things that it was really is an interesting project because at the time the the second version of dig comments. So let me see if I can describe this succinctly. So we had one version of dig comments that was the very first version was like really simple like blog like thing where you just had you know a simple row of comments. Then we made a second iteration on dig comments where you could vote on them and you could have nested comments so you could reply to somebody above you. And then that was outgrowing itself because if you had tons and tons and tons of comments, we were loading an enormous amount of HTML on your page. And also people were having these kind of complex conversations and it was really, really confusing to follow a conversation in it if, if it was a big comment stream. So something like when the iPhone was announced, there was something like 1,700 comments. And if you went to that page, you were loading something like 500 kilobytes of HTML and it was really hard to follow what people were saying. And so that was a big problem. And so we, we went to revise it. And Joe Stump, who is the, the developer who worked with me on it, he and I came up with this comment system. And we, we basically were closing all of the children. And we were, when you open them, we'd load them with Ajax. And so that way we could have a much lighter initial page load. And we could also have a much simpler structure for the comments because you just got you know, your basic parent level comments and then could open up and you, the, the children. You could kind of follow the conversation a lot more easily. And when we first launched that, we didn't do a lot of user testing with it. We were in a big rush, and uh, we didn't spend enough time on it. It was really cluttered looking. It was really clunky feeling. You know, every time you opened a, a new thread of comments, the little loader came up, and it, it would take forever. And it was a pain in the butt. So we solved some issues. We made it significantly more scalable. We made it significantly easier for the, the real novice person. But for the advanced user and you know, somebody really wanted to follow the comment threads, it was kind of an utter failure. And, uh, and then we came around, you know, maybe a year after that. It spent way too long before we came back to, to work on it again. And uh, I think the current version of the comment system solved a lot of those problems. It's pretty amazing when you see people have, you know, 1,500, 2,000 comments all discussing something. And it works, and it's structured, and, you know, you can actually follow stuff and vote down the bad stuff and vote up the good stuff. and I, I think there's still tons of room for improvement, but it was a, it's something I'm, I'm fairly proud of now. If not, you know, the fourth version I'm quite proud of. The third version, a little bit of an embarrassment, and our, our dig users all uh, give us a lot of a lot of crap for that, which uh, totally deserved. Unlike Web 2.0, do you think HTML5 will affect the back end only, or will we see things change in the front end? Oh, I think we'll see things change in the front end. It's kind of hard to see now, but. When you see stuff like Google Wave, which is heavily written in HTML5, there are some, some real advantages to that. There's a lot of stuff people are faking right now in a, in a difficult way, but they're... Um... Oh, we're frozen again. We're frozen again. So uh, give us a second here and hopefully we'll catch up. Um, one of the next things I want to ask you about uh, when you come back is Delta Tango Bravo. Uh, John Victorio... But it'll be a lot smoother, a lot better. I think went in the HTML5 world. I, it's probably okay. just let me know when I'm when I'm back. June 13th. You're back. You're back. June 13th, right. 2008. Well, no, you're frozen. All right. I think we're back. I know. I know. It's a real embarrassment. Um, yeah, I have a design in the works. I actually had a redesign that um the server at Silver Orange and uh you know, I've just been busy. I should really <laughs> update that and I should update the blog. So yes, I will do it at some point, but uh I just value my spare time right now so much that I, I've had a hard time doing uh personal projects because I just been swamped so much a dig that you know when I get a day off on the weekend and I can take the dog up to the beach, I'd rather be doing that than working on my web blog. <laughs> I don't blame you at all. Uh, Delta Tango Bravo, I'm guessing Delta Bravo is Daniel Burka. Does your middle name start with a T? Uh, Thomas, yeah. It was a good guess on my part. Uh, so, uh, do you see any more questions here? What do we got? I agree. I'd like to know more about technology and process. Freezing again. Technology and process when you design. Um, yeah, nice. Do you, do you start uh, drawing or do you go right to Photoshop? Do you go right to Illustrator? Where when you come up with an idea, how do you concept it? Uh, when you come up with an idea, 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a really terrible drawer. Um, I'll whiteboard stuff and it's really ugly because whiteboarding is really fun and fast and you can erase stuff really quickly. But I'm not a pencil or a pen sketcher. So I'll generally whiteboard, move to Photoshop very quickly, and then move to code very quickly after that. When will you next be in the Northeast, New England? Are they like at a conference oh, or something? Are they talking I'm about conferences? Be, I think so. I'm going to be in New York in November for the Future of Web Design Conference. If you're going to be up there, Gilles. Gilles? Sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, so if you're going to be up there, that'd be great. I'm doing a, a workshop and a talk at Future Web Design. Very cool. Oh, man. Danny Trin just... I think we lost you again. Signed into the chat, there. who's the, the designer who works with me, the, the guy. Oh, okay. Oh, who is it? Uh, Danny Trin. Yeah. He's Hi, just Danny signed Trin. into the chat as D Trin. So he's this, he's this kid. He, he came into a couple of the dig focus groups. And uh, he came into the, uh, one of the focus groups. And he's really smart and had a lot of insight into how we were doing things. And, uh, and he and I were chatting. He came into another focus group later on. Uh, he and I were chatting. And uh, um, I was asking what he's doing after high school and you know, it, what, what he was doing. He was doing some really great work. And so then I encouraged him to uh, come over here and do an internship. So he came straight out of high school, came into an internship here at DIG and was really successful. And so he deferred his scholarship to UNC for a year and has been here um, ever since. And he's going to just, just left today. He's going to, to UNC for the year and it's going to continue as a contractor with DIG. So really talented guy, really nice guy. Wow, I hope we see uh, some cool things coming out of him in the, in the future. Um, so uh, what would you say is the average age at DIG? Yeah, you should have him on this show soon. Totally. Um, <laughs> the the average age dig uh, it's it's older. I mean it's probably probably around thirty thirty five. So you know a few older huh? really young people and uh, but also some also some older people. This isn't like thirty like, older. So it's all like seventeen eighteen year olds. You know. You're gonna get a lot of mad designers saying thirties older. <laughs> Look at them go. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, oh well. Well, I think I'm not uh, everyone's thirty. I'm just saying, <laughs> older people and some younger people. <laughs> yeah, you know who's uh, gonna be mad at you, Kevin, for saying that. Good job. You're gonna be uh, fired. You're, you're gonna I be am. locked he, out he, tomorrow. He ups the, he ups the age. <laughs> uh, well, I hate to do this. Uh, we're past nine o'clock already. Um, this has been a really cool chat. You know, I'd love to keep this going on for another hour, uh, but. Uh, our uploading our uh, video for, to Vimeo is going to be very difficult in doing that if we keep on going. Um, sure. So uh, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Thank you so much, Daniel Burka, for, for coming on to Design Chat. <clears throat> this has been an awesome discussion. I hope, uh, I hope we get to talk a little bit more in the future. And uh, if you're ever looking on Twitter, we use the hashtag Design Chat. Um, so I want to do some thank yous right now. Thank you to uh, Samana Mason for allowing us to broadcast from their, uh, their, their, their group here in uh, West Dundee, Illinois. Um, and a uh, cool note about them is that the, they, they are hosting and they started, they founded the um, CUSP conference, which is happening uh, next month, actually, September 16th. That's a Wednesday and Thursday. And, uh, and the whole idea about CUSP conference is that um, they ha the people they invite to speak at their conference aren't all necessarily designers by any means, but they do extremely interesting things that touch on design. So it's opening up the world of design to everybody. Um, a very cool event. So look into that. It's uh, cuspconference.com. Uh, thank you to Mashable for allowing us to do this chat every week uh, in their Mash Chat Lounge. Uh, this has been a great experience. We talked to Pete two two weeks ago on uh, uh, on Design Chat. Um, uh, thank you uh, again to Daniel for, uh, for coming out tonight. Um, and uh, next week, let me switch my slide real quick. I've got a special slide that says next week is we're having uh, a lady named uh, Dynamo. She just did all of the illustrations for the Mad Men, uh, Mad Men Yourself uh, website and the Mad, Mad Men uh, promotion. So if you're a fan of the Mad Men, 
show on AMC. Definitely tune in next week. She's a very cool chick, and uh, she's going to be telling us a little bit about that work. Um, so I'm uh, going to sign off now. I'm going to stop, uh, stop broadcasting. So um, uh, if you want to hear more about Design Chat, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Hoopajoob. That's my daily account, and then at Design Chat. Uh, uh, Daniel Berka is at D Berka. I'm sure he's uh, going to have cool announcements about what's happening at Dig and all the cool stuff that he does. Um, so thank you again, uh, Daniel, for coming on. It's been amazing. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. All right, guys, I'm going to hit uh, stop broadcasting here. Uh, we'll catch up with you in the Twitterverse later. All right. Bye-bye.